Are we live yet? We are live. All right, friends. How's it going? Katie Day down here in Houston, Texas with my OK friend, Stephen Kim, Whoa. out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> Canada, yes. Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Thank you for um, that. I am very excited for today's guest, as always. I'm super excited for today's guest, though. Um, our guest today comes from a hospitality background. Um, she is currently the Vice President of Operations, Recruiting and Expansion for a large real estate team in sunny Tampa, Florida. She not only manages day-to-day -day operations for their team, but also recruits talent, oversees the processes, and what I would assume probably is the glue that holds everything together. Um, outside of this, she is an all-around badass, taking on personal challenges like I think it was a week-long fast, which we'll dig into, um, and the 75 Hard Mindset Challenge. She is well-known in the real estate community for being an all-around awesome human, but also empowering and inspiring those around her. Join me in welcoming Amanda Dahl. What's going on? Yay! Amanda, that intro. Okay, so first, I love the intro, and secondly, it's a good reminder that I need to update that because so much of that is outdated. I love it. it. Just, no, no, it's okay because that just tells me like I'm not on my game. So anyway, we, we have progressed since then, and we can talk about that. But so glad to be here with you guys. Yeah, Amazing. I'm really excited that you're here. So I guess let's uh, just hop right in and let's, so obviously things have changed since you last updated your bio. So let's talk about your journey in real estate and kind of what you're doing today. Yeah, yeah. So I am in the 60, right in the 60 days of 90 days total and transitioning from the vice president to CEO of our organization. Well, shit. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh. So it's been fun and it's been crazy. It's been all those amazing things. Um, and so I will round that out uh, at the end of, well, almost the end of next month. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, you tell me where you want to begin. <laughs> so yeah, I guess let's let's kind of start from the beginning, maybe not like birth, but as far as, you know, your transition <laughs> into, too. yeah, I was born on, yeah. um, your transition into real estate, you know, from hospitality and, and other careers, right? Getting yeah. into real estate um, and obviously you've had a lot of different roles in the real estate world. So um, let's talk a little bit about that, I guess. Yeah, so you did mention uh, hotel and hospitality. That's the majority of my background. I worked for a management company that had uh, Marriott's, uh, Hilton's, a lot of Starwoods. So I grew the corporate ladder very quickly. And by the time I was like 23, 24, I was like, I was a general manager of a hotel. I could tell you what shelf in what storage closet on what floor the toilet paper was. And I was like, there's gotta be more than this. Um, <laughs> So I actually, I'm from a small town in Alabama. So I decided not only to get out of hotels, but also move. So I moved to Tampa Bay in 2010. Um, and I was like, you know what, let me try with this company and, and just see if maybe a bigger city will be better. And sure enough, you know, a year into it, and I'm like, same stuff over and over again. So I started piddling around. I worked at a startup for a little bit. Um, and I helped them grow a couple departments. And then by 2000 and uh, 14. I was like, you know what? I'm over it again. So I started looking for jobs and I did my first uh, interview in November of 2014. And after uh, a very interesting and now looking back at it, I'm like excruciating four and a half month interview process. I joined Jeff in March of 2015 and I joined him. He was a young agent with uh, a gritty, gritty, gritty uh, attitude and, um, you know, do it all, just kind of go, go, go 90 to nothing. He's a high DI on the disc, if you know what that is. Yep, yep, um, heard he of him. Someone who could, who could take everything that wasn't sales off of his plate. So I joined him in March of 2015 and the year before he had done about 35 transactions, right around eight and a half million. And then we did all of 2015, me, him and his brother was working with buyers. We did that whole year, the three of us, and we ended at 85 transactions and 21 million. So we had tripled the business and volume, over doubled, what's that? Yeah, almost tripled in, in transactions. Um, so that was kind of it. Running a marathon while drinking out of a fire hose and juggling. And I got licensed within my first six months. So I knew nothing about real estate. I was actually going through my first real estate transaction uh, as a buyer. Um, so I, I kind of had a taste of that. And that, I mean, the rest is history. We doubled our business year two. We doubled our business year three. We about even, uh, we were like we kind of plateaued about four, year five. We did a few more transactions. And then last year we rounded out at 235 and that was a 68 and a half million. So well, not, not bad, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This not year a bad trajectory. We were around 300 
and we'll hit right around 100 million and we are 18 large now so yeah that's awesome that's so yeah. cool um i want to know why the interview process was four and a half months I was long just gonna ask because that. Like, so here's the thing right is you're always told to hire slow and fire fast right mm -hmm. that's always like that's the, the old adage you hear over and over and over again but as as what i would assume was a single agent at the time looking for some support right like how did it take four and a half months yeah so are we brand agnostic can we talk about brands no that's fine you can whatever yeah, you yeah. want so i'm a, uh, i don't know i like to be respectful so i'm with keller williams i've only known keller williams um and so they have robust training right they identified themselves as a coaching and training company a while ago then they rebranded as a or reinvented themselves as a technology company and so they teach you the process, the career visioning process is what it's called. And um, it is a series of interviews, right? You do a screening interview, then you do a personality assessment, then you do a group interview and you do a life interview and you do a get the book interview and you do a defend yourself interview. You do all these different interviews. Um, so I think first and foremost, it was about going through the process. Secondly, though, I was that first hire and it's like, you're going to get real serious or you're not, right? So when when you go from having someone who's kind of temporary that you're paying hourly for stuff to I'm looking for that empire builder, which is exactly what he was looking for. Yeah. It's like you're responsible for a salary now. And like if I'm going to hire this person and she shows up the way she has in this interview process, like I've, I'm making a commitment to myself first and foremost. Right. Because if I don't grow the way I told her I want to grow, dude, she's going to leave my world. Yeah. So I think it was a matter of like the commitment. And he was super busy at the time. I think on his own, he had like 14 or 15 pending at the time. So it was a matter of getting those interviews in like he should and follow the process. Yet also the commitment to having an employee and having a salary and things of that nature. So and I was so intrigued. I mean, I every time I left an interview with him, I was like, I was either like on cloud nine or crying. Like either he <laughs> was so deep into like daddy issues and all these. I'm like, oh my God, how did we even get there, right? So, so I was so intrigued by the process. I'd never in a million years gone through an interview process. And I come from like hotel corporate, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. heavy corporate, yeah. yeah. That's it. So, so I was so intrigued and I remember it was like interview four. I said, I was like, if that man, I had two other offers on the table. I was like, if that guy does not offer me a position when I come back, I'm gonna have to tell him I gotta go. Yeah. And sure enough, he uh, our next meeting, he slid an offer across the table and the rest is history. What was it about what was it about him that had you wait out? Because you already had two offers on the table. That's hard. It's hard to kind of like yeah. put that on hold, hoping that this hits. But what was it? Was it a particular thing? Was it a moment, an event, a vision that had you kind of be like, okay, I'm gonna hold out until that's, the offers? That's it. And and the short answer for you would be, um, and this is an amazing book, by the way, it's called Rocket Fuel. Hmm. Rocket Fuel talks about the uh, the visionary and the integrator. Together, they make rocket fuel. So you got the person that casts the vision and then the person that can go implement at a high level. And so when we were sitting at that table, like, you know, I told you about hotels before, like I was, I kept reaching my ceiling, right? So it's like, I was capped out at what I could do next. I was capped out at income. I was capped out at all these things. And so I'm not someone who's naturally motivated by money other than more zeros for the good that money can do, right? But for me, I like opportunity and I like growth and I like autonomy and I like flexibility. There's a lot of other things that motivate me. And so when I met him, he was, he's born in 84. So he was 20, I don't know, eight, uh, 29 maybe. And like, he was a young, greedy guy. He didn't have culture. If anything, he was like flexing around the office, right? He had zero culture, yet he was willing to do whatever it took. And so when we were going through our interview process, man, that guy didn't know anything other than exactly where he wanted to go and what it was going to look like and what it was going to smell like and what it was going to feel like and what it would taste like. He could cast a vision that totally had me intrigued. And in the process, he basically said, so here's what I can do. I can offer you this money and I can tell you that I'm going to bonus you on net profit. And I can only show you the net profit I had from the year before. Yet if you show up even half as good as you have in this interview process, girl, we're going to build an empire. And so for me, what I heard was bet on yourself. And I know my work ethic and I know what I'm capable of. I bet on myself every single time. So I was like, listen, I'm willing to take several steps back so that our trajectory is like a million steps forward. And the next five years I gave myself, I reached my income, my income goal in four. I have four different sources of income now. I mean, there's wow. so many things that happened from that. But it was all because he could cast a massive vision and he's like this is just as much whatever you want it to be as you want it to be so that was cool 
That's so wow. Cool. That's like like hairs on your arm. Yeah, I still get goosebumps when I talk about it. So as someone who's looking to hire, like here's the deal: you have to know your audience, their personality mm. style for sure. If you're talking to an SC, you don't need to talk in a DI fashion, right? Like, like you need to know who you're talking to. And secondly, you got to be able to cast a massive vision because I didn't care that he didn't have culture. I didn't care that we didn't have the sweet office setup. He could cast a vision and I wanted to go where he was going. Wow. So yeah. someone who's a high DI, like we all know the DIs, you know, they want to get there. They're going to do anything in their, in the power to get there. They may not just have the most like efficient plan or like the I's dotted, the T's crossed. We can laugh because that's the, the deficiency of a DI. How did you see through that though? You see this young guy, not many years in the industry, who has this grandiose vision. How do you see through that and to believe in that, like where you're coming from with all this great experience? Like, how does it, like, how does it happen? Well, a uh, great question, by the way. And I think for me is, I again, he knew exactly where he wanted to go and what it was going to be like when we got there. He just had no clue how to get there. Yeah. So for me, I'm the master at the roadmap. So I'm like, yeah. that's exactly what you need. I can build the roadmap. I can put the systems and I can put the processes in place. And here's the deal. Now, know it, like really knowing myself, that's not a huge strong suit of mine. Yet I am I have a personality where I can live in it long enough to get it where it needs to be. Nice. I love to build and I love to grow. It's the maintaining that I absolutely loathe. So I'll get it in place and organized long enough to get us through it. Yet once we're there and we've got a system in place, don't ask me to maintain it. Like I, that's, I'm just horrible at that. I, I have no interest in doing it. I'm horrible. And what's really funny is six years later, now I've replaced myself in all of our roles. And the people that I hired, they make me look like a joke. Like a joke. I thought I was a systems girl and now I laugh because my director of operations who replaced me in that role, she's a systems whiz. And my... <laughs> My newest member, who was actually my first college intern, oh, she's a master when it comes to organization and spreadsheets and all, and she's so much smarter than me. So I laugh now because I thought I was it. I was just <laughs> in it long enough to get us where we needed to go, which I think is, is super important for people yeah. to understand. The goal is to hire people way better at it than you are and way smarter than you are. And a lot of people can't get out of their own way. So that's yeah, that's so key, and that's something that. You know, I always say like, once we found that marketing coordinator, once we found that transaction coordinator and these people to put in positions that like, they're good at it, like, okay, I'm good at it, but they're great at it. Right. Mm. And it's just like, man, like, yeah, I can put together a listing agreement or I can, you know, read through a contract, but like now I'm like here, cause I know I'm going to make mistakes. So you just, you just do it. Cause it's going to be better. <laughs> like, and it's what you love to do, right? Exactly. Yeah. The other person, it's what they love to do. It's what they thrive in. It's the, like, uh, what a travesty to hold on to it because you need control. Also not to like, you're, you're totally like robbing someone of the opportunity to really live in a role that they love for what? So yeah, I agree hundred percent. Why do you feel so many people, especially in our industry, are afraid of that, are afraid of relinquishing that control? I'm going to say relinquishing that control in air quotes because really there's not much control other apart from like the, the efforts and the systems and the foundations you have in place, which for most people, I hate to say in this industry, it's pretty loose. It's pretty lackluster. But how, how do you get past that? How do you get to the point in your career to be like, you know what, I do need to relinqu relinquish control. It's all about delegating. Mm -hmm. what's the fear like what's that th sorry what's that thing that stops people from understanding that and then implementing that such a great question and i think i think this is like multifaceted so to speak right i think first and foremost like it's their baby right mm -hmm. it's only been them and so goodness gracious no one could ever take care of my clients the way that i do <laughs> which is so not true i don't care if your face is on the sign or not it's so not true and like that's a that's a, you know we talk about scripts a lot in our industry and and like we script every day so i realize that there's some negative connotation around this word and really like you script your husband and you script your wife you script your kids you script the doctor like you script everyone in your life when you're saying something more than once and you do it with confidence and passion that's it it's just objection handling it's all it is and so what you'll find, though, is when you do decide to delegate, like you can actually say that to a seller. Like, here's the deal. I am the pit bull negotiator. I'm the person you want to come in. You want to do the, the um, assessment of your house and we're going to find a price that works for you. And then I'm going to step back in to negotiate like nobody ever has. Mm. Now, you don't want me dotting your I's and crossing your T's. That's what Amanda's for. And man, does Amanda love to do that? That is her sole mission on our team is to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. 
across <laughs> and you want her doing that. You don't want me doing your paperwork. Mm -hmm. And when you set it up that way, it's like, yeah, you can absolutely lean on a team and the seller or the buyer that you're working with completely understands that. So I think first and foremost, it's getting that limiting belief that only you can take care of your clients the way that you can. It's not true. As you grow, there are pieces only you're going to be able to do, right? That's your value. And yet there are other pieces that team members can do way better than you. And as long as you set that expectation, a buyer or a seller, they don't care. Which leads me into my second point, which is value. A lot of people value themselves in that regard. They want to be helpers. They, that's why they got into this industry. I want to help sellers sell their homes. I want to help buyers buy the home that they want. And they value themselves in that regard. So when you realize that your value is more than helping someone buy or sell a home and you get out of your own way, mm. like that's not what most people want to be doing anyway. It's really not. So whether it's value or it's limiting belief that other people can't take care of your clients the way that you do, I think those are the two biggest things. And then the third one, honestly, is that they just don't have the patience and they expect everyone to do it perfectly. And the reality of the situation is if you can get leverage in your organization and they do it even 80% good, dude, you're winning at such a high level. Like we're human. Nobody's going to do it at 100%. And when you lead with the fact that people are going to make mistakes, you have, you made mistakes when you first got into the industry. If you can get that out of your head, you'll succeed when it comes to bringing leverage into your organization and delegating properly. Amazing. So this leads me to the next question, which kind of it's a great segue. When you're hiring for your organization, like I come and I want to, I want to work for you. Yeah. What's the one thing you look for? It's the non-negotiable. What's the yeah. one thing you look for? Culture. And for us, culture is made up of three pillars. We have three pillars in our organization and our culture. The first one is production. We are a team of production. If we're not producing, we can't be around each other. We okay. can't do the things we love to do, and we can't have our team. Number two is accountability. We are extremely accountable people, people who hold each other accountable and people who hold our, ourselves accountable. And then the third pillar for us is team. There is no I in team. So if you're an agent and I need you to pick up a lockbox or drop one off, or I need you to pick up a sign and drop one off, I need you to print your own listing paperwork and highlight it, you are willing to do it because we do not succeed alone. So mm. those are the three things I'm looking for. And honestly, the majority of the people that we get into business with are newer people to the industry. So I can teach you skill. I can teach you scripts. I can teach you how to do a list. I can teach you all of that. I can't teach you culture. So mm. if you don't have that culture piece, which is those three pillars, then we can't talk. And do you have, so culture takes time though, right? You can, you can agree. It takes time. It's not like, boom, day one, you got great culture. Fantastic. Let's go. Is there some sort of probationary period? Um, like most teams like function off of like when people align with, with your organization? Well, so yes, everyone goes through a 30, 60, 90 day, right? So that's Perfect. whether it's the training program, or however you want to call it. So our 30, 60, 90 day program. So everyone's got that 90 day probationary program. Mm -hmm. Yet even in the screening interview, like when someone sends me your name and number and says, hey, they're interested in a team. Like if I can hear in your voice, like entitlement, if I can hear in your voice, like not really willing to work hard at all, I just want to cherry pick stuff. Like the conversation is probably not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So everyone has to show up in some form or fashion to even get through the CV process, career visioning. And yet once we actually have a team agreement and now we're in business with one another, there's still that 90 day probationary period. Yeah, you wouldn't have even cut it if you didn't meet the culture. Show that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So out of curiosity now, how many interviews do you all do with, with potential team members and how long is that process <laughs> on average? Yeah. So I learned in goodness gracious, if someone from KW is listening to me, they're probably going to smack me because they tell you don't do this. And I feel like it still works in my favor. So you're, <laughs> never, you're never supposed to skip a step and there are steps in the CV process. So I will never skip a step yet. I do consolidate. When I can consolidate them all into one interview. It's cool. It's yeah, fine. yeah. Or two, right? And and I did because I realized that especially because we get into business with newer agents for the most part, like they have they're on a like a ticking time clock. Like they've only they've only got three months reserve. If that, they gotta start making money quick. Yeah. So I can't take them through a month-long process or a two-month-long process. So I consolidate meetings. So meetings that should have been an hour, I consolidate them to like two back-to-back 30-minute -back meetings. So mm -hmm. I'm not wasting their time in traveling up to the office. And also I'm knocking out two with one. Good. Um, and, and I'll piggyback them off of each other. And in the process, you get me the majority of the time. You also get some one-on-one -on -one time with our team owner, my partner, Jeff. Excuse me. And then you also uh, get to do a group interview with some of the members on our team. And then I did add a piece in. And that is I want you to come shadow our team meeting. 
because yeah. I can sit across the table and tell people how we operate all day long and they still won't believe me. So I'm like, great, come see for yourself. Mm-hmm. We do team meeting every Wednesday. Come see, we pull back the black curtain. So you see what we talked about, how we hold each other accountable, you know, what the meeting structure looks like, how we interact with one another. So that's a piece that I added in. And I feel like there are some people who have left that meeting and go, oh, you weren't kidding, man. You guys say you're accountable, <laughs> you're accountable. And I'm like, great, that's, I'm not wasting my time now, right? Yeah. It's so much yeah. better to find out now than six months from now. Yeah. That's crazy. So in terms of the 30, 60, 90 day probationary period, how, how lenient are you? So let's just say like, look, Amanda just, didn't eat any food for like a week last month. Like she's not a lenient person, man. No, she's... but I'm just, but, but is, is, is that, is that even in your vocabulary or is it kind of like, it's so regimented. This is the way we run it. If you can't meet it, you're out. Like. So teams operate differently. We are yeah. not all created equally for sure. And so if you've gotten to the point where you have a team agreement, we're okay. You're, you're within culture. Okay. So now it's really up to you. Like that first really meeting aside from your onboarding that we do, that first meeting is Steven in the next 12 months, what do you want to do in real estate? Mm-hmm. And most of the time I get some monetary, the $150,000 over the next 12 months. Great. If that's the case, we're going to work a formula backwards. So you know exactly how many transactions you need to close each month for what average commission at what average price point, right? And then we're going to dial that down to weekly activities. We have this plan. I can't make you do the plan. And I also didn't give you the goal. I didn't say you join our team and you have to sell a minimum of two homes or four homes a month. And if you don't, you're off the team. It's Here's the deal. I can't make the goal for you. It's your decision. Mm -hmm. You make the goal, though, and then you let me know you're committed to the goal, and then it's my job to hold you accountable to that. Sometimes it changes, though. Things happen. If I could do, I mean, we went through a pandemic, and relatives died, and people had to move, and people lost their jobs. There's a lot of things to factor in. So I don't ever decide your goal. You do. If you want to do your goal, though, and you want to do it at a high level, then here are the things you have to accomplish. And so I take that same approach or we take that same approach when it comes to the 30, 60, 90. Like it's very simple. In the first 30 days, you are going to log into the MLS and you're going to preview 10 homes a day. That's look at them in the MLS and then go actually preview them if you get an opportunity to get into them. Then for once a week for the first four weeks, you're going to write a practice offer. So you pick a pretty home in the MLS and you write the practice offer. Now, if we show up week two and they haven't done that homework, you're not fired. You're just hindering yourself. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, ask me how many people I've literally fired off the team. Zero. They've all invited themselves off the team. <laughs> the this seems like a lot of work here. I'm, I'm yeah. going to go ahead and, you know. <laughs> well, well, did you yeah. go preview your 10 homes? No. Okay. So tell me more about that. Well, you know, I just did this. My intention was good. Okay. So our intention is going to get us to our goal. No. Okay. So what are we going to do next week to improve? The so next week we show up and they didn't do it. People who do that plan, within 60 days, they've got a pipeline and properties under contract. Yeah. If they're not doing it, they're only hindering themselves. So it's going to take them six months to get up and running. Yeah. And it's not my job to determine who's got more time or not. Exactly. I just know that there are certain requirements. And if you meet those requirements, you're more than welcome to be on the team. What I also know, though, is six months from now, if you haven't done what you're supposed to and you're not making any money, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to come to me and you're going to be like, Amanda... I didn't do what I was supposed to, and I can't not make any money, so I have to go get a real job. Or I'm going to come to you and go, listen, you haven't done what you're supposed to do. So either we're going to have a conversation in six months, and you're going to tell me you have to get a real job, or you can shape up instead of ship out right now, and let's make you some money. You decide. But if you want to show up every day and be at our team meeting with your smiling face, and be around our group, you're more than welcome, but you're not gonna be able to go this long without making money before you have to go get a real job. So why don't we save ourselves the heartache and do what we're supposed to do? Some people will jump on board and some people won't, and that's okay. I'm like, I'm I need really? to get off this podcast and go start making calls. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like shit, I have a to-do list somewhere. Let me figure out where it is. I'm, I'm like inspired over here. Well, there's no additional money to me, right? I've got yeah. three seats in my office. We're gonna have the office space whether you're here or not. You don't yeah. get any leads until you do literally your 30, 60, 90 day plan. In one of the in one of those three months, there's a, a sheet that says, what do I need to do to get my leads turned on? If you didn't do it, you don't get leads turned on. So I'm not giving you any of our money. Right. I mean, we've got like we're a big enough team now to where we have systems and processes in place where they're not just for one individual. Mm-hmm. We're going to have them whether you're here or not. So it doesn't cost yeah. me any extra money. 
It's just causing you heartache. And uh, Amanda, how big is the team now? 18. Wow. So we've got two inside sales associates. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Well, it would be six, including our virtual assistant support staff. Um, And then we've got however many left of that are our agents. Agents in production. (laughs) My very special agents that I love so dearly. Um, Yes, yes. All right, let's get a little tactical, right? So we kind of just touched on a few things, right? As far as, you know, new agents starting out, you know, I think it's very important to be previewing properties and know know the numbers, know your market, right? Um, you mentioned that they need to write mock contracts and that's something that's really big, right? Going over the contract over and over again, making sure that you understand it so you can actually explain it to a client, right? Um, what are some things that you would say are non-negotiables for a new agent when they're first starting out? Things that they should be doing um, or learning? Yeah. So, I mean, here's the deal. An agent at any given time should be in five conversations and five conversations only. Lead generation, lead follow-up, going on appointments, negotiating offers, script practice, and role play. When you're new, you don't have any appointments. So you don't have any follow-up or you don't, you don't have it. You really don't have any leads. You have to go out and get the leads. So you don't have follow-up right away. You usually don't have appointments right away. And you're not negotiating anything right away. So what does that leave? Lead generation and script practice and role play. And that should be your life until you start getting leads to follow up with and going on appointments and negotiating offers. And it's those five things. If it's not those things, then it should literally be delegated to someone else. Leverage. Now, here's the deal. Leverage can be a who, which means a person. It can also be a system. So what systems can you use to leverage yourself? Maybe you don't need to go hire a person. You could get a system though. And there are a lot of free systems out there. I'm a fan of free. Maximize or max out free. And then let's look at like basic levels, right? That everything has a free level. And if you like it that much, then you can purchase the bigger level once you grow. Yet everything has free. So those five things. So that's what it is. So it's literally how many people can I talk to? so that I can follow up with them, so that I can get them to appointments and get them to writing offers and negotiating those and get them to dog on closings. And when I'm not doing those things, do I know how to handle those objections? Like, do I know how to talk to them in today's market, in any market? So I don't know if that was tactical enough. (laughs) It's super tactical. And it's, I mean, you know, Steve and I talk about this a lot is like, you know, it's like, it's the basics, it's the basics. And you know, people think that it's so difficult. They think they need to go out and spend lots of money and buy all of these systems. And like, there are so many good free systems and putting in the sweat equity to get there, like we'll get you where you, where you want to go or where you need to go. Steve, what were you going to say? I feel like I interrupted you. No, 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 not at all. Cause I think there's so much, like people talk so much about script practice role play. And like, you know, we never want to practice on, on our clients. Cause that's the worst thing to do. But the thing is, it's the first thing I find that people let go of that. They're like, it's not important, but it's incredibly important because the more powerful your conversations are, the higher you're going to qualify people in your business, right? Like I have a brand new team member. He's been, sorry, not brand, he's been on for 60 days, two months. He was on with two other high performing teams. The guy closed 30,000 GCI in one month. And he said, honestly, because you showed me how to script, uh, script play and role play and script practice. Sorry. I got those mixed up. I get them mixed up all the time, but I was like, yeah, because you now know what to say. You don't sit there fumbling and be like, okay, well, I'll just talk to you later. No, you know how to extend the conversation and get to the appointment. So everything you said, Amanda, is like feverishly writing down because I'm like, yep, 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 yep. It's that's so, so important for agents and not even new agents, all agents, no matter what. And it's the high performing agents that know that inside and out and are committed to that. And so we all need an Amanda. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Every organization needs an Amanda doll. So, <laughs> well, it well, thank you. And it doesn't stop, right? When you get to 60 million and 70 million and 80, well, I don't know, maybe your goal is 30 million and you'll be happy with that. Let me tell you, when it was three of us, we made a lot more money than going through to six yeah. level, six and a half, you know, the millionaire real estate agent, six and a half or six quasi six and a half level. And you are a lot less profitable and a lot more responsibility. Now you're making more money. So obviously you're making more money. But when you look at your profit margins, they're a yes. lot less than they were when you were three people in little overhead. And that's just the reality and a lot less headache. Sometimes I joke and I'm like, let's just blow it up. It'll be the three of us. And, we'll, you know I mean? <laughs> and, and I love my people. Don't get me wrong. And sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, like you, you feel like you're banging yeah. your head against the wall. My point in saying that though is you don't stop the basics. 
Like success is boring. It's mm. a very boring. You talk to Tony Robbins, you talk to Winfrey, you talk to Tim Stewart, talk to anybody you want to, and they all have the same five principles. They might deliver them in a little bit different of the way of a way. Yet they'll tell you consistency, right? Consistency. They'll tell you you get back to the basics. You don't let yourself get sidetracked on it. Like it's all the same stuff. So you find the fun in the entertainment and things that aren't these five things like if you're looking for fun and entertainment and variety and all those things you better figure out something else because you've got to stick to the basics and when you get to that level even the masters will tell you they still practice script practice every day because yeah. it's like muscle memory right that's what it is like if you're not working out that muscle it's not working so no you're absolutely right those five things five things Amazing. Um, Amanda, a question for you, uh, being in the industry for as many years as you've been in, um, what would you say is a possible disruptor to our industry? So years ago, it was like the Zillow, 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 this, Zillow, that, you know, what do you feel is going to be a major disruptor in our industry in the next, let's say, five years? God, great question. Um... I was actually doing a speaking engagement uh, like a week and a half ago and they asked me like, what's the big, what do you feel like is the biggest challenge or the biggest disruptor right now in our industry? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and so I realized that's a little bit different than your question. Yet my, um, honestly, my answer was there is like the consumer is overloaded with information, mm. completely overloaded with information and they are underwhelmed by the average agent. <laughs> There's a value there. I mean, you can get like, it's kind of like they tell you when you get sick, like, don't go Google it because you get the worst and the best of everything. And it's like, what is there to believe? Like, how do you know? Yeah. And unfortunately, there is like information everywhere when it comes to real estate and the consumer's like, well, how do I know what's right? How do I not know what's right? And the average agent won't be able to tell them that. So I think real estate agents, like true real estate professionals is what we are. This is a profession. This is an industry profession. And so those individuals need to understand the market that they're in. They need to understand what's happening when it comes to the iBuyers and the Zillows and all the, you know, Amazon now wanting to do real estate, all these different things. They need to understand not only their hyper local market, they need to understand at a high level real estate as a whole. And that's the value they bring to the consumer. And so I think... That was the long answer. I think the short answer is absolutely understanding first and foremost. It's not like you wake up tomorrow and say, I want to get my real estate license. And then you don't learn. Like it is your responsibility <laughs> as a professional to understand, understand the economy, understand the market, understand real estate, and not just in your area, understand it countrywide, like in the entire country, understand that mm. so that you can be a true value add to a consumer. Because otherwise, they can go get on any website and get any information that they need. And then you've got a town full of FISBOs, right? Because everyone thinks they can do it themselves. <laughs> so that's what I feel like. If, if, if real estate professionals don't really hold true to that term, we're going to have a bunch of just order takers. Mm. Um, and honestly, we're, our profession is literally going to get wiped out. I really wish that you were a little bit more passionate about this, Amanda. I, know. I you know, <laughs> like I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I just wish I could see some more passion from you. Yeah, I told you I'm animated. My eyes get big. I talk with my hands. They put me on stage and make this microphone. I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? I'm a hands talker. You're I'm swinging it around. I'm literally like that. Yeah, my name's Amanda Dono. And I was like, this is horrible. I love that. That's hilarious. Um, Katie, do you do we have time for a, a last question? Our of course. our infamous of course. last question. So, Amanda, yeah. this is the question that stumps everyone. <laughs> no, it doesn't actually. I don't know why I said that. Um, a little Still bit different. Hitting. Yeah, a no. little bit of a different question. So it is your last day on earth and you have a choice. You have a choice of your favorite meal, either where you're going to go purchase this meal or have it made. And we want you to share with the audience what that meal is going to be. Last day on earth. Yeah, I, I would hire a sushi chef. <laughs> any sushi I want, all in front of me. I want it fresh right in front of me. All right. Okay. Okay. Sushi. I'm a sushi fanatic. I don't. I hope that answered your question. Do you have a favorite place where you go for sushi? 
Uh, so there's a place that's local here. It's called Pisces. It's okay. amazing. It's in downtown Dunedin, okay. which is right down the road from where I'm at. Uh, and that's like in the in the Tampa Bay area. And yeah, it's amazing sushi. Sweet. Okay, I'll awesome. Put that one on the list. We're happy it's not P.F. Chang's, like our last yes. like 1,800 guests. It was like P.F. Chang's. Everyone. It was like it was like three in a row said P.F. Chang's. I was like, what is this? What is the craziness. No, David's gonna be so not. upset when he hears sushi. this. Sushi <laughs> for sure. Second would probably be like brick oven pizza. It's got Ooh. a brick oven though. Yes. Specific. I like it. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Katie. <laughs> yep. All right. Cool. Well, Amanda, we do truly appreciate you taking the time today to chat. Um, one, you're so knowledgeable. You're so fun. You're an absolute badass. And uh, as I said, so passionate, clearly about the industry and about, a little. you know, just moderately passionate about the industry and everything. So no, very much appreciated. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know people have, I wrote down a ton of notes, so I know people at home are doing so as well. So <laughs> So thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait until we can see each other in person. I know. I was literally working on a trip and it got postponed. So I am I am absolutely coming to Texas, though. So thank you for having me. You guys are amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. I appreciate you.